Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I have a very special guest. Uh, Dr. Mark Thornton is joining us from Alabama. Dr. Thornton, thanks so much for being on the show. Eric, uh, my pleasure to be on, on your show and to, to be able to uh, speak to your audience here today. Great. Dr. Thornton is a uh, senior fellow at the Mises Institute. He is a research fellow at the Independent Institute. Uh, He regularly publishes articles on on Mises.org and and also wrote a book called The Economics of Prohibition. And uh, he's contributed so much to the cause of liberty, so I'm I'm so glad to have him on the show today. Now, I wanted to have you on, Dr. Thornton, to talk a little bit about uh, an article that you recently published on Mises.org talking about the ill omens of the skyscraper curse, which kind of illustrate the um, Austrian business cycle theory. Could you begin by explaining what this theory is, uh, what are business cycles, and how are they caused in the economy? Sure thing. Um, It's very important to know this, uh, to be aware of the fact that there are business cycles, uh, and to know what causes them. Uh, otherwise, people are completely in the dark about what's going on in the real world. And it can put you at risk, uh, literally. Uh, but the a business cycle is simply the ups and downs, the booms and the busts, the expansions and the contractions, where we see the economy doing very well for an extended period of time, and then get stuck in the quagmire where the economy is not growing where there's a lot of unemployed people, where you see home foreclosures and bankruptcies and and things of that nature. Um, What the Austrian economists of the Austrian school have contributed is a theory of why this takes place and how this takes place and also how to stop the whole process. The fact that the business cycle is not a natural phenomenon, but it's an artificial phenomenon. Once you understand the theory, you understand the cause, and you also have a good idea of what the cure is. And basically, uh, back more than 100 years ago, Ludwig von Mises, who, the namesake of the Mises Institute, wrote a book on money in which he uh, constructed what has become known as the Austrian theory uh, of the business cycle. And what Mises did was he showed, and this is pretty straightforward common sense, that when a central bank lowers interest rates in an economy below market levels, it can cause a lot of problems. And we see this elsewhere in the economy where government set prices uh, lead to shortages and surpluses and distortions of all sorts. Uh, It's just that in this case, the central bank of the government is lowering interest rates in the economy, and then you see your credit card rates, loan rates, mortgage rates all fall lower along with the central bank-controlled interest rates. So this distortion in prices of the interest rate lead people to invest more uh, because the relative value of everything that's capital uh, increases. So Uh, businesses uh, increase in value, stock prices go up, home prices go up, Uh, all those capital-related things increase in value, and so people want to produce more of them. Um, And they're rushing into stocks, they're going into real estate, they're making business investments uh, in the economy. And this is the boom. This is when um, everybody is investing and making money This is when everybody's spending on luxury goods. Um, They're borrowing money to to consume, uh, and they're not saving much money. And so this is the period in the economy where everybody, or just about everybody on average, is living beyond their means. And so everything looks great. But, of course, that kind of thing can't go on forever. Um, People are making investments that, initially appear profitable, but ultimately turn sour. And those, so those, those investments that all look good at one time are eventually revealed to be male investments or bad investments in the economy. So this, this one period where everybody's making money 
is followed by another period where everybody's losing money. Stock prices are falling, land prices are falling, home prices are falling. Um, there's unemployment, there's uh, foreclosures, and there's bankruptcies. And uh, so Mises showed that it, with this whole boom-bust phenomenon was originated with the central banks and artific artificially low interest rates. And so that's the cause of the business cycle. And, you know, it might seem psychological and mainstream economists attribute the business cycle to psychology rather than something real uh, happening in the economy. So they look at the, you know, the boom as entrepreneurs being overly enthusiastic and overly speculative. And then, of course, in the bust, everybody's depressed and scared. But the Austrian theory of the business cycle explains why people are speculative and overly enthusiastic during one period and why they're in a con contraction, uh, depressive mode in another period. And, every, and it's happening to most people in the economy. Right. So it sounds like that it's this ease of credit that the Federal Reserve is kind of injecting into the economy. And people love the booms because they, they feel like they're rich. They get all this stuff. They get to produce all these things that are kind of unsustainable in the long run. It, it, we don't actually have those resources available, but people just assume that they do because the interest rate is misleading them. So how do skyscrapers fall into this whole situation? Uh, how do we know that a boom or a bust is going to occur kind of because of the construction of a skyscraper? Well, I, I admit, Eric, it does seem pretty implausible, but it's not really the case that the building of a world record-setting skyscraper causes a world economic crisis. It's that the conditions necessary for a world record-setting skyscraper are the same ones as an economic boom. And so what leads up to the building of a world's tallest uh, skyscraper is artificially low interest rates. And, of course, right now, uh, central bank interest rates are near zero. Uh, and then that sets off the boom phase in the economy where everybody's making money, Everybody's spending beyond their means, um, and people are making investments uh, in the economy and in real estate uh, to try to take advantage of all that. So there's new technology, there's new products, there's new means of production, there's all sorts of new stuff going on in the economy, and there's, of course, luxury spending beyond your, your means going on in the economy, and... A skyscraper is all that. I mean, it's real estate. It's an investment. Uh, it's all sorts of new technology. Uh, and it's luxury spending. It's spending beyond your means. Uh, and so those, they're really two uh, of the same basic material, uh, and that's the economic boom. And it takes a while. You have to have a long boom for the record to actually be achieved because you have to have a long period of speculative behavior and reinforcing in people's minds that they're always going to make more money um, going forward. Um, and these record-setting skyscrapers are really the ultimate in high-end uh, luxury spending. They typically have a luxury hotel, uh, luxury goods stores, retail stores, uh, four-star hotels, Class A office space, uh, you know, the, the latest things in terms of elevators and escalators and, uh, you know, ventilation systems, water systems, sewage systems, all of that has to be created anew. So if you really studied um, the records of the past or the records of the future, what you're going to find is that they have to come up with, like, all new ways of getting cement um, a thousand meters up in up in the air and you have to come up with new cranes and new um, you know materials which will keep the building from swaying 
uh, ventilation systems, the whole works. So it's 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 just really the the ultimate in in the economic boom is to have a record-setting skyscraper occur. You know, and, and Dr. Thornton, this, this sounds a lot like Keynesianism. It sounds like investment solely for the sake of investment. Like, we don't really care what the outcome is or how much it costs or what we're actually investing towards the consumer's actual demands. But um, just let's just build it just to just to see that we can. And, you know, the, the consequences of the future, you know, let's just ignore all of that stuff. Um, can you tie what we've been talking about here into Keynesianism and what those ideas stand for? Sure. I mean, the, the uh, Keynesians love this stuff. Um, first of all, they think that the key to economic performance is consumption. When that clearly is never a problem. I mean, if people have money and jobs, uh, they're going to consume. Uh, there's nothing holding Americans back uh, from spending, except for having a, a job and higher wages. So what the economy should really focus in on is saving money, uh, saving resources, uh, and entrepreneurship, which is putting that money, that savings, uh, into the proper place in the economy, or else suffering the consequences. So they're all about, you know, spend, 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 and even if that means invest, 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 or digging holes and filling them back in. But the ultimate in all this is over in China, you know, and China has been hailed as uh, this miraculous economy, and believe me, there's a lot of great things about the Chinese economy, and uh, their move towards the market mechanism uh, has seen a remarkable improvement in their standard of living. But eventually, their economy is going to run into a big hole, because what they've been doing over there in order to generate 10% GDP growth is basically they tell the provincial leaders of the various provinces that you have to attain a certain economic goal. Uh, and it's a tough goal. You know, getting your economy to increase by 10% in a given year is very difficult. But what they do is they allow these leaders of the provinces to borrow money from the state-controlled banks for investment. And so now sometimes that investment is helping manufacturers set up manufacturing or shipbuilders set up shipbuilding. But a lot of the times in recent years, they've been just investing this money in anything so that they have way too many international airports with no flights outside of China. And they've got high speed rails that are not really used that much. And they have, of course, all the Olympic facilities that are falling into ruin, and along with dozens and dozens and dozens of skyscrapers. And they just finished off or just opened up, I guess, um, the world, excuse me, the tallest building in China. Uh, they have dozens and dozens of, of buildings that are qualified as super skyscrapers. Uh, and so they've been building, uh, you know, not for economic reasons, but in order to meet these political targets, uh, they've built entire ghost cities that could house more than a million people that are completely empty. And so, you know, we've seen the ultimate in Keynesian mercantilist policies uh, over in China. And as I said, they've recently set their record in their economy uh, is really having a tough time of it right now. Their stock market is doing fine, but their overall economy is uh, contracting. Yeah, this this really reminds me of um, things like these large sporting events like the Olympics where they just kind of uh, build all this stuff for this very, very temporary consumer demand. And, and maybe that demand isn't even there in terms of these abandoned uh, villages and towns and cities that they're building. But they just build them just for the sake of building them, and then all of a sudden they abandon them. And that's not really in accordance with what I'm sure consumers would actually prefer for those resources. 
Now, you mentioned that um, in, in the article that this particular uh, skyscraper was being built in Saudi Arabia, but this is by no means localized to that particular area. I noticed that you pointed out the cronyism of uh, you know, the princes being involved with the contracting companies, which is generally often the case with these huge endeavors um, that are state and central bank kind of oriented. But um, this isn't localized to Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, this, this could happen anywhere. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. The a world record uh, setter uh, is often, most often associated with a world economic crisis. So, you know, the Chinese have a record. They have trouble on their hands. Europe had a record a few years ago, and we saw the European economic crisis or the European debt crisis. And so it can be localized, but the world record setter is usually globally has a global impact on the economy and the kingdom tower in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah Saudi Arabia is uh, scheduled to be one kilometer uh, tall the uh, the height of uh, comparative length of 11 football fields uh, so it's a massive project it's going to easily beat the current record holder which is the Burj Khalafi Tower in Dubai, which, of course, that was, uh, that set the record in the summer of 2007, so it was a very accurate predictor of the end of the housing bubble and the beginning of the global economic crisis, uh, but this is, this is really, this really takes the cake, this Kingdom Tower, because, of course, there's no need to build tall uh, in a country that is very sparsely populated and has a massive uh, land mass on which to build. So this is probably the most irrational building of all time. Um, it's being built in the desert and in, in, a, in a relatively small town. Um, and it really just takes the cake as far as uh, luxury spending because it's going to be really high-end uh, stuff and of course it, it beats the previous record by a substantial amount you know and it you can you can kind of sense that skyscrapers should be built in places like Manhattan or London or the Chicago business district um, but they have really no business other than just pure vanity uh, to be building this record where they're building it today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm talking with uh, Dr. Mark Thornton, and um, we are speaking about uh, interest rates and central banks and the manipulation and distortion of the markets by these central banks and their monopolization of money. And um, Dr. Thornton, when I when I talk about markets and prices in particular on the show, I'm uh, I'm usually referring to them in terms of conveying information between consumers and producers and you know other actors in society. And um, so prices confer knowledge about uh, the scarcity of goods and uh, consumers' demand for those goods. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about how interest rates, as a price themselves, um, convey kind of information between producers and consumers in the uh, market? Oh yeah, it's it's very important. I think your point about prices conveying useful information throughout the economy and and bringing resource allocation into line with what people really want is a very important one. And every time we see the government interfering with those prices, we see problems develop. We see teenage unemployment um, consistently more than twice the level of normal unemployment. And basically that's because we have a minimum wage law. Uh, and all of that excess teenage unemployment is the result of that. And it's very, very harmful, much more harmful than most people ever know or consider. Um, but interest rates, when the central bank messes around with interest rates, well, that has a global macroeconomic effect, and it's a distortion effect that fools both consumers and entrepreneurs. And so with respect to the business cycle, you know, the lowering of the interest rates changes the prices of capital goods and land. 
um, and it makes it appear that certain investments are going to be much more profitable um, than ultimately they turn out to be. And so for entrepreneurs, they it, this artificially low interest rate conveys wrong information, which seems to work out well in the short run, but of course in the long run, there's this cluster of entrepreneurial errors that occur that sees businesses failing, lower profits, bankruptcies, um, of all of these entrepreneurs all at the same time. You know, an example would be, for example, like say the interest rate is lowered in the 1990s and everybody goes out and starts making uh, computer chip factories. And initially, everything looks great. They're getting a loan at a very low rate and they have expectations of high prices for computer chips. But instead of just one company building a new factory, you might have four or five building new factories. And so with four or five factories underway, the demand for the proper labor and the proper technology and the proper materials is bid up. And so the entrepreneurs have higher cost. And then when they complete their factory, there's way too much supply because of the extra factories. And so the price of chips is way below what their expectations were. So cost goes up, price go down, you lose money. And so that artificially low interest rate is conveyed bad information to entrepreneurs. It also does the same thing to consumers because consumers look at low interest rates and they say, well, instead of a $90,000 house, we can now afford a $160,000 house because the, with the lower interest rate, our payment is going to be just as much as it would have been um, you know, if we bought the smaller house at the higher interest rate. So people, consumers get suckered in to buying a bigger house with a bigger loan value. The payment may be the same, but the loan value is much higher. And so this new homeowner is suckered into buying too much of a house. And consequently, they're going to have a hard time uh, going forward when, when interest rates rise and the price of housing falls. All of a sudden, they're underwater on their loans. And they can't sell their house and move to a, a better job because the house now is only worth $110,000, and they can't just sell it and make up the difference, and so they're stuck. And if they lose their job, they can't get to a new job. And so it just distorts information all across the board. The interest rate is the most important price in an economy. We can survive with a couple of, you know, with, for example, gasoline prices are higher than they should be. We can survive that. Um but with the interest rate, it screws up every, everybody's calculations and causes macro economy-wide uh, distortions and problems and ultimately losses for everyone. Yeah, it sounds to me like this really speaks a lot to the people who oppose free markets. They have these arguments that say, well, you know, in, in free markets, there's too much competition. There's, there's all these people that are producing things. We don't need all of that stuff. We need just a couple people producing things. Or uh, there's overconsumption. People are consuming way too many resources. And it sounds to me like uh, their problem is exacerbated and caused uh, by the Federal Reserve and the manipulation of interest rates. And if we cut back on that, I think that the, the concerns that they have would be much alleviated. That's absolutely correct, Eric. The market left to its own devices is a challenging and uh, environment. Um, there's no free lunch, and you're not given subsidies, and you have to carefully calculate uh, the things that you do. And so right now I'm very worried about uh, the economy uh, what I see is that there's not enough savings in the economy. There's too much debt in the economy, both in the private and the public sector, even the corporate sector. And, um, 
and and stock markets uh, you know people are relying on this inflated stock market for their retirement uh and it's likely not going to be there uh just as they need it and the one bright so- uh sign is that the the new generation I'm not sure what they're called, but uh, the new generation is uh, saving money, uh, and they're not putting it in the stock market. They're putting it into a, a bank account and cash, and uh, they're not spending frivolously. Um, if they can't afford a car, they don't get a car. Um, and so they're the first responsible generation to come out of high school and college in quite some time and they I think it must be because they've seen the way how dangerous the Federal Reserve has made this world and um, they're sort of disconnecting themselves uh, from the mainstream media uh, from the government they have no use for the government telling them what they can and cannot do Uh, they may not be libertarian completely but they they definitely are, you know, against government intervention in our lives. Uh, and they have very libertarian uh, social views of things. And if you look at the demographics, you see that 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 new generation uh, completely supports uh, issues like uh, gay marriage, medical marijuana, legalizing marijuana, uh, things like that, and. It's only the older people, the, not the people who aren't very smart, that still support those government prohibitions. So as cautious and, how, and concerned as I am about the world economy right now, I am uber enthusiastic uh, and optimistic um, about the generation that's coming out of high school, that's in college, coming out of college, or recently graduated, these are the people who have had to face uh, the negative consequences um, of government and, and this whole line of that you know you got to go to college, you got to go hundred thousand dollars in debt at all cost. Um, it's just like the previous generation or their parents who were told that you have to own a home, you never lose money on a home, you'll always make money on real estate. And so this new generation and their parents have been burned by the government and the central bank. And if they know, I don't think a lot of them know how the central bank has done this to them. And I applaud you and your show for for providing that alternative source of information. Um, You know, I'm just very optimistic about the ideological future of this country. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thorne. I'm so glad that we can have the opportunity to discuss these kind of things, especially with the advent of the Internet. We have all these new channels that we can uh, talk about this kind of very important stuff. So, um, uh, Dr. Mark Thornton, um, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. We have just a a couple seconds left. Maybe if you could tell us uh, where people can find a little bit more of your work. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Mark Thornton, T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. You can follow M-I-S-E-S on Twitter. And, of course, we have a Facebook page that's very active, um, Mises.org. It's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. It's the largest economic web page in the world, and uh, it's great, and it's all completely open access for everything, including audio and video lectures, um, just everything under the sun, free daily lectures. Uh, We have academic journals. Uh, we we storehouse a lot of the older libertarian economic journals, and so it's just a massive uh, resource to re-educate yourself about the real economy and what government's doing to you uh, behind your back um, through the money and banking system. Thank you so much again, Dr. Thornton, for being on the show today. Uh, this has been an episode of The Austrian Circle. I hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode. Have a great week. Take care.